We've got a special Legends territory coming your way today. It's Fraun and Kratz, and one of our friends, our foul territory teammate, is a former 2015 Home Run Derby champ. He is probably, maybe most proud of this one, the Rutgers Hall of Famer in 2019. 11 seasons in the bigs. A lot of success with the Cincinnati Reds early on in his career. Eventually, a little White Sox action. Yankee and Met, Ranger, eventual Pirate. You can see that all behind him in his just gorgeous studio in the lab. Let's bring in Todd Father. Todd Frazier on Legends Territory. It's all about you, Todd Father. You ready? You're on the hot <laughs> seat right now for about 20 you, minutes. You made me smile, man. Rutgers Hall of Fame. <laughs> that's definitely up there. I was waiting for Eric to say something witty, but that's okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Well, no. let me start this way, actually. Do you think that of all major league players of all time, you have the most Jersey pride. I would say without a doubt. <laughs> I think anybody who knows me or who's played with me, um, I take very, I take a lot of pride in where I'm from. Um, I use that as, as you know, motivation. I use it as going out there and dominating and say, Hey man, I got something to prove every time. It's something that I, you know, it, was, it gave me a little chip on my shoulder, even though sometimes I didn't need it. At the same time, it was like anytime it's funny because anytime I faced a guy from New Jersey that I was that was pitching against me, I made it like an option. I felt like, you know, Michael Jordan would make up a story just so he can get <clears throat> even more into a game. So that's kind of what I did. I said, I can't go home knowing this guy from Jersey beat me because it'll be the talk around New Jersey. So that was my biggest thing that I did. So you wanted to be the best from Jersey or you just enjoyed the you enjoyed the Jersey camaraderie. I, I, I say I, I wanted to be the best, but when Mike Trout came along, that, that was thrown <laughs> out the window. We, <laughs> we all know that. But, um, yeah, I enjoyed the camaraderie. I enjoyed talking a little smack. I enjoyed basically knowing that, you know, I'm going to see this guy in the offseason. So who, who's going to be able to talk smack? Who's buying lunch? That kind of deal. So that's what made it best. Yeah, but, okay, so – that's kind of the reason I wore this hat today. This is our one of our Team USA hats that we wore back in back in Puerto Rico, the pre Mundial, and we got we got to sit just pretty much as close as we are here on the screen. We get to sit this close in <laughs> in the bus together. Now I had already had a small cup of tea, not coffee. wasn't even a whole like they didn't even give me coffee. I was up in the big leagues for just a short amount of time before we had played there. Yeah, you were coming up. Take yourself back to being that Todd Frazier, the Todd father. Like Scotty said, Little League World Series champion, soon to be Rutgers Hall of Famer. Did you think you would have the career that you had, or did your career fall a little short? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think first my dreams and aspirations were to sit with you on a bus going to Puerto Rico. I think that was the first thing I wanted to do. No, but serious, no, that's a, that's a solid question. I... I always dream, I dream big. And that's something I always had. One of my goals, I wanted to be a 330 hitter. I wanted to hit 60 home runs. Was that going to happen? 99.9% <laughs> no, if a miracle happened. But if I fell short, should I hit 40 home runs? I think that was an awesome goal for me. I did that. But I think the biggest thing that I always wanted to have was a 300, be a 300 hitter. I think the best that I did was uh, 273 one year. Uh, which was good, but you know, and a after that, I'm like, you know what? That was probably the best I'm gonna do. So maybe I need to get that goal down a little bit. But yeah, that was probably the biggest thing. I played 11 years. I had a blast doing it. Could I have done better? Of course. I, I think every every ball player would say that it's something that you strive to be the best. Not not only on your team, but in in Major League Baseball. And you know, my biggest thing was going out there, helping others, making people smile. But yeah, I, I think I left a little bit on the table, man. I, I, I wish I could have played longer. I wish I can go back and talk to my younger self and be like, hey, man, don't take this too serious. These 0 for four days aren't going to kill you. And eventually that happened. But I was, I was a lot older when that did. I'm going to flip this a little bit, Todd Father. Do you think you should have been up in the big sooner? Because I'm looking at your minor league stats right now, and you didn't get called up until you were 25 years old. Uh, yep. guy that we talk to pretty frequently, Whit Merrifield, I think got called up at somewhat of a similar age, but you look at the minor league stats and you're like, Hey, I think you deserve to be up sooner. I think once you got up to the bigs, you were one of the top rookies right from the jump. 
So were there times when, especially in those age 23, 24 years that you were in the minors going, what the hell do I need to do? Uh, you know, you know how many conversations I had with my wife and my parents and my brothers at the time, like, when the hell are they going to bring me up? If you want the truth, you know, we're speaking truthfully here. It, it, it was at least, you know, after my first year in AAA, I'm like, all right, what else do I have to prove? And I think that's only natural coming from a competitor, coming from a guy who's dreamed about uh, playing in the major leagues. Um, I blame Scott Rowland, too. I wish he would have retired one year earlier. No, I'm just messing around. We I always had that conversation. I'm like, dude, when are you going to retire? But yes, it, it was something I always I always thought about. I'm like, I mean, I don't I, I thought I did everything right. So, yeah, um, nothing else you can do. It was out of your hands. Control what you can control. Move on and just tr keep trying to get better. I remember I got called up um, to go play in Philadelphia, my first ever call up, and which was the coolest thing in the world. I had about 60 people there during batting practice. Uh, I'm not starting the game. Uh, how about this, Kratzy? My first ever swing in batting practice, I swung and missed. And and Chris Spire, who is our uh, bench coach, is sitting there. He stops throwing, and he's laughing his ass off. Everybody's dying for about two minutes. I'm like, come on, just throw me another damn pitch so I can get this out of the way. And then my first at bat, first swing, I, the bat comes flying out of my hands, goes into the stands. The guy catches it. I didn't know what to do, retrieve it or not. It was a whole debacle. I ended up striking out, and then I got sent down the next day, which, I mean, that, that's a one, two, and three right there that you'll never forget, which is the most disappointing thing ever. That's incredible. Good hitters mm -hmm. throw their bats. Great yes. hitters swing and miss in BP. You always swing and miss one time <laughs> a year. I don't hey. know if and, – and, and I remember I swung and missed one time, and Raul Abanez was the only person in my group. It was just me and him. He goes, you feel like everybody saw that, don't you? I said, no. He goes, I guarantee you, everybody thinks – no, nobody saw you swing and miss, but you think yeah. everybody saw it. And that was – I was so – that is – that's hilarious. Your first – your first pitch. First ever batting practice pitch being a major leaguer. Talk about a waste of a first-round pick money. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's good luck. You swing and miss on your yeah, first yeah. pitch from BP, right? Yeah, I, 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 we're going to make it good luck now. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Well, then fast forward 2015 because it's probably the biggest moment in Reds history over like a at least seven, eight year span where there wasn't as much to cheer for with the Reds, right? Um, I would say kind of since that time period up until what was it like 2020, I think they made the playoffs during the COVID year where like more than half the teams made the playoffs. But, you know, I got to experience it firsthand with you going back to Cincinnati. We spent some time there this past year and everyone comes up to you and thanks you for that moment. So is that the biggest moment in your career based on how much you get fanfare wise afterward? I would say without a doubt. I mean, it's funny that the whole stuff leading up to that i always told my brother we got <clears throat> we got a new format coming up let's practice it a little bit so after we take a regular batting batting practice in the off season i'd say all right let's do it for like a minute long and see how many pitches we get then we do two then we do three eventually we got the four and i'm like holy shit i'm exhausted here dude we got we and we did it more and more and lo and behold, I was leading almost – I don't know if I was leading the National League at the halfway point because I was the number one seed. So I must have been leading the National League in home runs. And um, it was just unbelievable, man. I remember having all my family there. Long story short, my wife was, was pregnant with uh, my second child. The electricity goes out in the house. We had no AC. She's sweating bullets there. It was 110 degrees. Um, I had to go out afterwards to go to a party after party. I'm hanging out with Neo and Eric Davis, and we're just having <clears throat> a good old time. Excuse me. And um, I come home, and she's like, you're going to McDonald's and getting me a, a Frosty so, or a milkshake. So I had to go get her a milkshake at 4 in the morning, come back, get her the darn milkshake, and then I had to get up at like 7, 8 o'clock because I was the ambassador. So I had to go back and forth. It was just an unbelievable time that I'll never forget. But I felt bad for my wife at the same time. So did you train enough for that? Could could is it possible to train enough for the home run derby? Because I know Aaron Judge, he hurt his shoulder doing the home run derby. Well, hasn't done it again. Like, 
there's there's like there's dudes that don't want to do it because it's that tough. Can you train to get good enough at it or in shape enough at it? Well, I I would say this. I think honestly, you know, people talk about oh the home run derby ruined my swing. I for one, I don't think it ruins your swing because everybody in the last round of batting practice, I would say eighty percent of ball players try and launch. So these guys know how to hit home runs for the most part. I don't think that ruins your swings. I was exhausted. I, I think that was the biggest thing. Um, absolutely drained. I went in and told Brian Price, the manager, on Sunday. We had a game Friday and Saturday that week, and I said, dude, I need a day off. And he said, you know what? You got a day off. But I think training-wise, you can do as much training as you want. It's like spring training, Kratzy. When you go out and you have to stand around for about an hour and 15 minutes before you hit again, your legs are exhausted, you, there's no training for that. And oh, people are always like, oh, well, put some metal cleats on and just, you know, walk around the backyard for an hour and 15, pretend to take ground balls so your legs get used to it. I, there is no way you can get used to it. Top Father, I'll say this, and then I'll ask to you if you think it'll happen at some point, but you should be in the Reds Hall of Fame. Do you think you should? Have you gotten any communication on it yet? I don't know how that works. Like, every yeah. team operates differently. Some of them probably communicate about it. Others probably just pop it up with a surprise at some point. So, any word? Yeah, I mean, there, there's been talks about it from going back to last year. I mean, I don't know I, if you want the truth. If we're being if we're being honest. I'm, yeah. I think of the I think of the great Reds that have played there. You know, we think of Pete Rose, Joe Morgan, Johnny Bench. You know, just to name a couple. You know, so there's there's tens of twenties of forties of more people. But I mean, I think I've had some. I had I had my best career there. Um, I think the home run derby is the highlight. If we're going on the home run derby for sure, um, I'm on the fence if you want the truth. Um, if we're just being honest, I think I'm 50-50. Uh, but I think if we're going by what the what people remember, what they love and enjoy, and something that they'll take on forever and ever of what I did, uh, then I definitely think I should be in. But if we're going on stats and um, alone – I'm not sure if you want the truth. So that, that's something that the committee had to figure out. Um, do I think there's more deserving people? Of course. But I did do a lot for that community. I did do a lot, you know, for that city. And um, I worked my butt off. So I know every time I go there, people always give me credit. Hey, man, you always had a smile on your face. And uh, we love the way you played. So it's a question to, uh, to be uh, talked about as we move forward. So as you're coming up through the red system, you're watching this team's like, this is a legit team. You're like, I'm going to join this team. We're going to do what? Were you guys talking yeah. about win the World Series? Like, obviously, they ran into a buzzsaw in 2010 when you were a minor leaguer with Roy Holiday mm. throwing a no-hitter. But, like, what was that conversation like? And how did that go all the way until when we were teammates again in 2017 playing with the Yankees? Yeah, that was um, interesting because, first off, I was trying to figure out whether I was going to be on the team or not. There was a bunch of different things going on. And uh, well, eventually, Miguel Cairo got hurt, and um, I got called back up, and I didn't look back after that. I kind of took off. Um, but, you know, there wasn't many conversations. I think there was a little – there was something in the air kind of deal. You, like, we knew. We kind of expected, like, hey, we got something going on here. Let's not, you know, screw it up. You know, Scott Rowland got hurt. I played third. Then when Votto came or when Roland came back, Votto got hurt and I played first. So I was up for playing any position. We were doing really well. We didn't really know what to expect. But something during that season, talking with Joey Votto a little bit on the bench, we both had an off day. And he's like, bro, I want to get to know you because we're going to be doing this for a while. We're going to be in this playoff hunt for a while, maybe even win a World Series. And for him to say that, you know, kind of caught me off guard a little bit because we didn't talk in the beginning. You know, Joey – did his own thing, and I kind of did my own thing or what I did, and we became real close ever since this conversation. It was probably for about three innings, and we just kind of figured, like, wherever we're at, we're going to have a good opportunity here uh, to make it to the World Series, and we we had we, we had them, and we played the San Francisco Giants. We went up two games mm -hmm. to none on the road, came back, hey, we got to win one out of three, and then the whole Hunter Pence with his meetings and firing the team up, Buster Posey hits the grand slam, actually, and uh, the rest was pretty much history. And that was kind of the demise there a little bit. Guys got injured and then eventually traded. And uh, I was kind of that starting piece to get traded. 
They haven't really bounced back since then. Now, actually, you're seeing that next wave of promising Reds talent all kind of coming up together at the same time. So that could be, you know, the next run finally for this team besides the one 2020 playoff appearance. So yeah. let's move on to some other teams, though. So uh, you are also one of pretty few on the all-time list of guys that spent some time with the Mets and the Yanks. So you spent actually games-wise a lot more time with the Mets than you did mm -hmm. with the Yanks. But do you feel like you had a stronger connection with the Yanks, maybe because of the playoff appearance? Um, yeah, everybody asked me this question, like, what, what is the difference between playing with the Yankees and Mets? And I explained, I, I can't give you an answer. I think expectations. I think um, when you walk into a clubhouse knowing, like, hey, man, I, this is it. Like, this is Mecca. Every time you walk into a place, like, boom, we got to lock it in. You know, there's other places I played in where, you had time to do that. It felt like when you were in Yankee Stadium, walking by the security, uh, seeing you know some of the guys when you walk in, like everybody knew, it was business like a little bit. You know, it was fun. Don't get me wrong, but I kind of enjoyed that part of it where it's like we expect everything out of you today. It's not what you did yesterday. What you're gonna do tomorrow? Get your butt in here and do your job. And I enjoyed playing uh, playing in the Queens. Man, I had such a blast over there. I have some fond memories over there because I played there a lot more. Um, yeah, I, I, it's just for some reason going to Yankee stadium, the, or the, you, you felt the, the, the ghosts and, and the gods of, you know, Yankee past watching over you. Like, you know, dude, we're watching, you, you know, you can't skimp out on anything. So kind of, kind of that little aura and stuff like that. Would it have meant more to win a world series in obviously the Mets, you weren't close when you guys were there, but yeah. for, for the Yankees or the Mets being the fact that you're from New Jersey, would it meant more to win a World Series there than in Cincinnati, the team that gave you your first shot? Wow. Um, that's a tough one because growing up in New Jersey, you think about the pinstripes, you think about how many World Series they have, and you want to be part of that lore. You want to be – you want your name. I remember, like, talking about Mike El Cairo before. He hit the triple to tie the game in one of the playoff games, and every time he goes to Yankee Stadium – he goes, he goes, Frasch, watch this. And he was, he was actually, he just walked out and put his hand up and people were going nuts. Like they don't forget about that stuff. And you're a legend. I, I, I think it probably would have meant more in, in, in the Bronx, but it would have been, oh, it would have been meaningful in Cincinnati because those blue collar people out there love Cincinnati. There's about five or six states surrounding the area that root for Cincinnati because there's really not much more, there's not many more teams over there. And you got the people of West Virginia that want that win. So you think about the people that wake up every morning at four or five in the morning, go to their farms, you know, provide food for everybody. So it's, you know, it would it would have probably been a little better at Yankee Stadium, but it would have been really close knowing how the people are there in Cincinnati. I, I, I would I wish I had both. I think that would have been perfect, but the cards weren't in my favor. All right, so we lost. We, you and I, I got to watch from the bullpen and from the yeah. dugout. I lost the Astros. You hit an iconic double that stuck in the fence up in Houston. Yeah. We needed to win one of two games when we went back to Houston. Didn't do it. Obviously, it's the infamous 2017 Astros. Yeah. How you like how does that sit in your crawl? Cuz obviously a player wants to win a World Series. That's what you Ultimately, at the end of your career, if you have a World Series, however you got it, you yeah. wanted it, and that. So, how does the whole 2017 Astros thing sit sit with you still to this day in twenty end of 2023? Oh, it sucks, man. I still I'm still pissed off about it. If you want the truth, I mean, listen, everybody's like, forget about it, don't worry about it, let's just kick it under the rug. Yeah, time time moves on, but you don't forget. It's something where listen. A ball could have been, uh, uh, you know, somebody could have missed a pitch or that guy wouldn't have hit that ball or they wouldn't have scored that run. So, yeah, that, that was my only time. It was uh, for me to get a, a ring. Um, uh, it sucks, man. I, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm still pissed off about the whole situation. It's just they, they got off scotch-free, if you want the truth. You know, it's, I think it's something where the commissioner should have really thought about what to do uh, to penalize these guys. It would have been great to play the Dodgers, that East meets West kind of feel. And um, listen, there's all types of ways of finding signs. That's from second base, the natural ways of doing it. And for them to do that, um, 
it still stings a little bit. Yeah, it, we moved on from it, but it's something I, I, I'll never forget because that was my only time really to get to a World Series and maybe even win it, you know? And like CC Sabathia said, we would have won the World Series if that didn't happen. Yeah, do you feel the same way with the Yanks have won the World Series? And do you feel like you deserved more of an apology from the players that beat you and that were cheating that year? Yeah, I mean, you think about apologies all the time. You know, you could just say it. I mean, it wasn't meaningful. We, we'll never know. I, I think there should have been more done, honestly. Um, <clears throat> not, I don't know if fines would have even done anything. I mean, it's something to really think about and ponder. You know, you see guys like um, – and, and I'm taking it to this measure. You see a guy like Pete Rose, you know, he bet on baseball and he still hasn't, he's still getting hurt for that. You got scandals back in the day, you know, and uh, people are still not around. I mean, they could have gone something a little more serious that, you know, could have scared some of the guys or even done something because there are some guys that didn't play after that. There was managers that, you know, were, were, were done for a year. You know, they, they lost some money, you know, they couldn't, I'm not saying they couldn't feed their children, but they, you know, lost money to provide for their families. So it's, um, there should have been something more. And looking back on it, it, it should have been something more than just a slap on the wrist. So one more, I mean, some people are like, well, you know, it was going on all over the place. Yeah. There was some stuff that the Yanks got caught with. There was some stuff with the Red Sox and the Apple Watch. What do you remember during that time? Like, what were the Yanks doing? Because at the very least, I mean, video was just kind of loosey-goosey, as they called it, right? You could just pop yeah. over to the video room and check stuff out. Now they've got people making sure that you're not seeing things in real time. That really changed the game. It kind of implemented technology mm -hmm. within the game and saying, hey, this could really affect the outcome on the field. We need to monitor this. But what do you remember during that time period where guys like, hey, we could just, you know, try and figure some things out and kind of scoot past the rules? Yeah, I, when I got to Yankees, I, I didn't hear, honestly, I didn't hear any of it. I guess it just, afterwards, when I got there, it was all over with. They, they got in trouble for it. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not 100%. But I was there when, when, we, we, when we caught the Red Sox with the Apple Watch. I still find it amazing how they can relay it that fast to somebody before a pitch is thrown. You know, that, that was unbelievable. Um, and then the whole scandal with the with knowing uh, what pitches were coming. I mean, if I'm – listen, Kratzy would attest to this. If I'm a hitter, <clears throat> and this is – I've known pitchers were coming from pitchers, tipping pitches, moving their hands. I'm going to hit that ball hard more than none. And when you hit a ball hard, good things happen. You hit it over the fence, it goes by somebody in there. I'm going to square a ball up a lot more if I know it's coming. I mean, I was uh, like a 180 hitter on off-speed pitches. Um, I give or take a couple points, I'm not sure. But when I knew a slider coming or a curveball was coming, I'm hitting that pitch really hard, and I'm usually hitting it far. Fastball the same way. I didn't miss many fastballs. So it was. It was cheating. It was something um, that, you know, has never been done before. And, you know, they got away with it. And that's, that's probably the last thing I'll say about it. They got away with it. So, he, But Kratz, he's got his Little League World Series title. <laughs> no way. Hey, it's got, the first. It's the got first, that. It's the first 20 minute interview Todd Father maybe has ever done without being asked about it because we talk about it in life. So thank you. If you Google it, you can you can see plenty about it. Yeah, you can I, you can find out about it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or Big just sit me down on the beach and we'll we'll talk about it or at a pizzeria. We're good. Hell yeah. But not not in public because he'll get crowded, especially if it's down the shore, <laughs> you know? Yes, hey, sir. Tom's River. Uh, thank you, Todd Father. If you want to see Todd Father, more of him uh, talking uh, ball than check out Foul Territory. Thanks uh, to the MLB Players Alumni Association for setting up the show here. For more info on your favorite former players, hit up baseballalumni.com. For us three, we're good for now. You can also check this out on Apple, Spotify, and wherever you get your pods if you want to listen to it on the go. See you next time on Legends Territory. <laughs>